Narrative record generated from extracted memory. Bracketed units translated to metric units or standard time. On Froon's spear. The local starscape appeared in the forward view screen as hundreds of ships erupted from subspace. We have been travelling for over two years to reach this nearly empty patch of space a great distance across the galaxy. Tens of billions of stars and several campaign fronts were bypassed by this waste of a worm hunting expedition. Report, I said to our sensors officer. The officer replied, Yes, fleet leader. Subspace sensors are detecting no traffic or communications, aside from ourselves, sir. Infrared has spotted increased activity in their home system, but nothing to suggest they have either ships or signals that can travel faster than light. Radio traffic is considerable, however. I took a moment to review my commands. Some time ago, a survey probe into the local region of the galaxy had detected signs of an unknown sapien species. I was required to remove the locals and scout every system within several hundred light years to prepare the way for a construction fleet to build a supply base that would enable us to open a new front deeper into enemy territory. My sensors officer had essentially told me that the recently discovered locals were the closest thing to helpless against us. My assessment that this was a worm hunting expedition was only reinforced. To another officer I said, Comms, instruct the scout division to survey every star nearest the locals' home system to establish how far they have spread. Following the completion of this task, the scout ships may purge any system that does not have a significant threat at their discretion, if and only it remains true that no subspace communication systems are discovered. The rest of the fleet will travel to a new rally point sitting 7.62 light bumps from the star in a direct heading. We will await the scout reports and generate plans based on new information. Yes, fleet leader, the officer said. I sat down on my command phone to monitor the intelligence reports as they were generated. I mused that, if I was fortunate and wise, this mission would not consume the remainder of my lifespan and leave me a chance to fight in the conflict that mattered one day to the Yell Empire. Maybe against the Lokru or one of the high species. Maybe the name fleet leader Yan Hula will be remembered by someone. I noticed as I looked down on my throne that my hair was all over it. Maybe I will just be remembered for excessive shedding. I opened a compartment on the side of my throne and retrieved a brush and my very high capacity lint roller. On Scout 25. When our scouting orders arrived, I was assigned an orange dwarf star, 10.5 light years from the yellow star that our new nameless faceless enemy occupied. I had only five others aboard my ship that were subordinate to me, but operated the ship in our free shift system. Whenever possible, our ships would be normalized in a manner that put me in command during any maneuvers but everyone would be awake during any action. As it was, two of us had slept through our arrival and redeployment within the Theatre of Operations. When we arrived at the system, I was awed by its richness. Two asteroid belts, specifically. Sure, it had a gas giant between them with a whole collection of moons and one terrestrial planet inside and one outside the belts, both barren. But this system had a lot of mass economically available. I was very excited, but the excitement was tempered by the knowledge that the locals were probably in this system too. My scout ship was designed to be hard to find on subspace sensors, but we still emitted heat and reflected light, so due care was required. Even then, it would take passive sensors of considerable capability to detect us, and while active sensors would work, we would also have a target that cannot alert the home system within a decade, which would give us at least two decades, and probably three or more, to do a job that should only take weeks. I plotted send the report back to the fleet over encrypted subspace comms and plotted a jump to the outer planet. It was time to scour each body and belt in the system. Our considerable supply of drones would be essential. On Froon's spear. I had the main fleet spread out in groups. Each of our logistics ships got an equal share of the battle group. The logistics ships were combination sensor ships, miners, refineries, factories, suppliers and data handlers. They were essential for the mission, and the survival of only one would still be enough for the mission to succeed, although on inferior timelines. Spreading them out allowed them to multiply the value of their sensors via interferometry. In other words, they could function as one giant telescope larger than a gas giant. What they saw was very interesting, as I quickly learned. Fleet leader, came the deep resonant voice of the intelligence leader as he walked onto the bridge. I have several key reports, sir. I said to him, I hope the purpose of the large structures around the homeworld is among them. Proceed. 
That and much more, fleet leader. Are you familiar with the space elevators of the homeworld? She asked. I am. Intel has concluded that these structures serve a similar purpose, but they operate on a fundamentally different design paradigm. The main failing of the homeworld elevators is the fact that they are little more than choke points for resources due to the several days it takes for cargo and passengers to transmit their great lengths, and they can only serve as one ground location, he explained. I am beginning to see a pattern in the facts you are sharing, I said, as he took another breath. Yes, sir. The structures around the enemy homeworld are circular and elliptical along paths that a real orbiting object could take. At first, we could not determine how the many ground connections along their limbs could be holding themselves up, much less the ring structures. One of our more clever ones suggested that the connections are actually under tension, forcing the rings to follow the rotation of the planet every rotation, and that they are held up by an active support mechanism. This mechanism is likely to be cables, or particular matter, that flow through the rings at greater than orbital speeds. Through magnetic interaction with the ring structure, this mechanism provides an outward force to keep them up and rigid, he detailed me. I think I understand, I replied. It is like a flexible tube that has become rigid when fluid flows through at high pressure. An excellent analogy, sir. The significance, sir, is concerning. These creatures, humans as they call themselves, are capable of shifting immense amounts of mass off of the planet. These rings can host many things above the atmosphere. Cities, farms, power facilities, factories, weapons, but most importantly, launch rails, he said, with a tone I did not like. I said, you consider these to be significant? Yes, sir. We prioritize the seizure of asteroid belts because they represent a lot of mass that does not need to be lifted out of a gravity well. Such a clever structure would turn galactic conflict on its head. What is more concerning is that once we identified their spectrographic signature, we realized that there is at least one of these around every planet, a large moon and the star. These structures are hurling craft across the solar system, and catching them too. They could be used to deploy a vast fleet on a small time scale, or evacuate even their homeworld in short order. As you said, this is clearly an important paradigm shift from either ourselves or our foes. Has this signature been shared with the scouts? I inquired. I turned to face the comms officer, who was already watching me. Message ready, sir, he said. I rolled my eyes, but knew inside that I was never letting this one go. Send it. He pressed one button without even looking at his console. Done, fleet leader. I returned my attention to my intelligence leader. I understand you have several more reports. He said to me, Yes, fleet leader. None, I fear, may be confident about our goals. On Scout 61. This year's long foray across the galaxy was the first mission for myself and my crew. Our wing leader handed us the safest series of destinations for us to check within the survey radius to act as a review for the green crew. Our first stop had us simply take a high detail recording of the system from two opposite locations that we would visit once before leaving, as was practical when examining the tiny systems of worlds around Jovians or Dwarf Stars. Then we had a multi-step survey for a more complicated system. Lastly, we had arrived at a red giant star, just over 20 hours of travel time from the home system of our next foe. Even as we regained focus after the turbulent experience of exiting subspace, an alarm was sounding. The instant it took the pair of us on duty to recognise the alarm was enough to panic all of us for just a moment, as it was only seconds before the off-duty crews arrived on the bridge. We looked at the screens and saw something we were never trained to deal with. In training, we were told to expect vectors of only so great a range of values. That is to say, we never expected to see a ship in real space going even 1% of the speed of light. Within 1.2 AUs of us was a ship travelling at 8%. This was a mind-boggling number. I'd assumed that it must be a tiny ship, but I awaited more conclusions from my sensor panel as we accumulated data from our passives. The actives were not automatically used because they worked by hitting a target with energy of one sort or another and watching for returns that- and that wasn't very stealthy. It would also take 20 light minutes for them to work, except for the ones geared for subspace. I turned towards the ship leader and my friend. Leader, if the other reporting is correct, the enemy may not be able to detect active subspace sensors. I recommend they use. 
The others turned to face him, but I knew how much value he placed in my suggestions, and I already knew his answer. Do it. Moments later, we could see an image form. We saw a tower of a ship, and we saw its mass distribution. There were no countermeasures in place to resist our senses, which only reinforced our belief that they were ignorant of the existence of such space. It was a strange and beautiful craft. It was falling aft first towards the red giant, when the three nozzles of its fusion drive system bellowed exhaust at impressive energies. Its fuel tanks were nearly full of tritium and deuterium, meaning that something else had gotten it up to its current speed. Perhaps it was a staged craft. Surrounding the terrestrial fusion reactor was a mysterious material folded and rolled in strange ways. We could not identify its purpose. Above that was a small module that seemed to contain storage and subsystems. Next up was a tower of metal, probably some steel variant that acted as a mast for some of the largest heat radiators that I had seen on the ship. Finally, there was an overbuilt monster of a physical shield that pointed in the direction it had come from. It was clear that it would oculate everything except for the heat radiators. Where did this crew live? Was it automated entirely? Something about this was making me nervous. My counterpart from second shift spoke up. At its current deceleration, it will impact the star's atmosphere. Nobody replied as we mulled over the odd picture we were forming in our minds about the strange choices made by the aliens. Then the ship leader spoke up. We will monitor this craft while we await instructions from fleet. Return to your previous activities. Why should arrive in 41 hours? We will all have plenty of time to gawk. On Scout 25. We had jumped to the Jovian system of moons around the one gas giant in the system because we had discovered an anomaly. There appeared to be a grey metallic substance spreading across a carbonaceous natural satellite. We were wondering if we had discovered some strange form of life rather than the humans we were looking for. We were ordered to sample it, but then we were to move upon our next assigned star system. We approached, slowed, landed, and scooped some grey goop into a sample box. It seemed pretty inert, but it was shedding heat. We checked the automatic sensors for radioactivity, but none was coming from the sample, so we set it aside in storage and left. It did not remain inert, as we later learned. We were ordered to travel out to our sister ship, Scout 61, to assume their task as the new guys had stumbled into a situation the wing leader was not ready to ask them to shoulder. On the way over, it occurred to me that it would be a good idea to dock for a few minutes to visit. Very little time lost, good effect on morale. We sent a request for permission to do so to the wing leader. She said she was pleased with me, that this was how a wing leader should think. The prospect of promotion was energising. The next day we had docked with the new guys. They were of mixed spirits, but I had a good moment with two of them. I am worried that we have made a mistake in wing leader's eyes, one of them said. No need to worry about this, I said, addressing them both. We need to wants to know deep inside that she is not throwing away lives. Maybe you are ready, but she needs to spend more time with you. Following an order like this shows you are trustworthy, and she will know to take that into account next time. It was days later, when the night shift leader noticed that the sample had lost mass, but this fact gained no notice against observations of the towering alien ship entering the solar system of the Red Giant Star. On Froon's Spear. I thought back to the briefing given to me by the intelligence leader. Artificial intelligences, genetic tampering. The humans were begging to be invaded. They were sucking mass out of their own sun and passing it through a particle accelerator above the star's equator. Such a beast of a machine was set to the task of mass producing mass in heavier than iron fusion reactors. Zero guesses where they got the energy for that. The home system of the humans was packed with massive projects. They were producing space habitats that could each hold millions of the primates by the dozen. Gases were being hurled across the system by great particle cannons in a dizzying array of parabolas. The second world was central to this mess. It was sending carbon dioxide to the fourth world, where it was caught by great magnetic fields while it was still in an ionized state. The second world was also catching hydrogen on a trajectory from the star. And what did they do with it? They sent it back. It was a mystery until that smart one the intelligence leader spoke of suggested that they were attempting to accelerate the rotation of that world. He had noticed that the apparatus that performed this was in a position on that world's sole orbital ring 
that the operation was inducing a rather efficient rotational force upon the world. Its rotation was only four times longer than the human's home world. He had calculated that they would be equal in only 22 years. It made my head hurt. Gases from the second world were also being used to supply the habitats. More information had arrived regarding the circular structure around the star. Along with habitats, it was producing interstellar ships like the ones seen near the star they called Aldebaran. They were also producing the largest fuel tanks I had ever seen. The spacecraft and fuel tanks were being accelerated out of the system by massive lasers that dangled down in the star's atmosphere to use it as a lasing medium. The tanks and the ships were fitted with laser sails, as intelligence had labelled them, which allowed these great masses to be sent out of the solar system. While they were being accelerated, they were sent fusion fuels from the innermost gas giant and the ice giant that was not rotating on its side. These streams of hydrogen isotopes were a serious concern. They created a mess and giant swaths of space were inaccessible to FTL travel. We carefully tried the path of one of these ships until it passed a distance of one light week, when the dwindling acceleration from the differing laser light from the star was replaced by a new source of laser light. We couldn't see it at first, but we soon discovered that one of those giant fuel tanks was outfitted with laser arrays, fusion reactors and very, very large radiators. We focused our sensors on the path ahead of the ship, where we found another one of these fuel tanks every light week. What had appeared to be a species mostly confined to the home system by a lack of FTL technology, turned out to be a tall industrial power at the centre of hundreds of interstellar highways, accelerating thousands of objects outward. Reports from the scouting efforts revealed major industrial efforts in all of the neighbouring solar systems, where they grew this infrastructure network, along with many more discoveries of the grey substance spreading across worlds. I soon realised that we would never be able to roll back the growth of this civilization if it was allowed to keep shedding these builder ships, as we have begun calling them, at such a rate. We would have to attack the home system at the earliest chance. On Scout 61, we had just arrived at one of the last remaining inner scouting target systems when we suffered electrical problems all across half of our backup systems. The ship leader had changed course to return us to the fleet for immediate refit and fault discovery. A choice unusual in its promptness and good reasoning, something that I was not used to seeing my friend express at the same time. The wing leader agreed, wondering how she had such a sharp batch of ship leaders on this expedition. She concurred that there must have been batch-wide flaws if our systems were all suffering in such a manner. We were going to have mechanics from across the fleet inspect our ship to attempt to discover the source behind the failures. When we had returned to our assigned logistics ship, we had quite the reception. It was seconds after we had docked with a node on the great ship's docking web that we had dozens of ship's mechanics pulling apart our panels. Some of them were the leaders of damage control departments of the capital ships. It took a long time, but eventually they had discovered some sort of problems in the wiring that they had only managed to detect by touch. It seemed to take a long time before a new mechanic could tease out exactly which sensation about handling the wire harnesses was the bad one. The fleet leader ordered a high priority refit for the fleet. He was quite annoyed that the planned launch of the assault was delayed. We waited. The scouts returned from their final tasks and our ship was fixed. We spent weeks waiting for the fleet to solve its problems. A few unusual setbacks cropped up but nothing suspicious. Or so we thought. We even got a visit from fleet leader Jan Hula. He has a grumpy sort but he was ready to get the fighting started. He gave us collective heart failure when he implied that the delays were our fault but it just turned out that he was joking. It would have been a good story if I had ever gotten the chance to tell it. On Froon's Spear I was reviewing our intel. The fleet was on standby while we waited for the final few readiness signals, mostly from capital ships due to their extensive refits. The logistics ships had only just finished producing copper wire and fresh superconductors a few hours before. Odd that they both had the same physical defects detectable by touch, but not by our instruments. It didn't matter, this wasn't my concern right now. I did not think on this much. I was honestly fascinated by the reports I was reading. These humans would probably offend every race whose ethics I knew of. They had used a combination of dangerously powerful AIs and advanced genetic engineering to modify themselves. It ranged from enviable health and no known maximum age to outright shocking dismissal of their natural form. Many of them did not fear cosmic radiation, vacuum, falling from great heights. Scores had wings or gills, 
and there seemed to be a segment of their population that distorted themselves so much that Dintower thought there were more than one species in this system at first. It didn't really matter. They may have had the majority of the galaxy's laser power in this one system, but we still had faster than light communications and travel. We had no fog of war blocking our awareness, yet they still did not know that we were here, aside from possibly one ship over 60 light years away. The final status updates rolled in. It was time. Comms. Instruct the fleet to prepare to jump to 12 million kilometers from the ice giant nearest our position. We will roll up this solar system before they realize they are under attack. Why formation? Yes, fleet leader, he replied. Moments later he announced, all warships signal ready for engagement. Navigation, I said. Jump the fleet. Athena. My task was to keep a figurative eye on every sensor in Sol. It was a task I was made for. I was ready to fulfill this task until we allowed the sun to die. It was my mind branch at Neptune which saw my first action in my centuries of life. An alien fleet had appeared out of nowhere. FDL travel was possible, evidently. I created a module in my neural network mind dedicated to learning its limitations and tactical implications. I did not like what I saw, but I figured my many parts could put up a good fight. It was interesting being one of the first to know that we, the human meta-civilization, were not alone. Despite the fact I was designed for war, and named after a goddess of war, I was not pleased to learn that we were under attack. That last understanding came from a signal originating from the fleet. It took several milliseconds, but I realized why we were getting a signal from alien ships and our frequencies. They had gotten themselves infected. A part of me was disappointed that I would not have a challenge, being the AI of war and all, but I would not squander the lives under my protection just for more fun. So I coordinated with a submind that was slowly taking control of the fleet as fast as it could make its nanomachines reproduce. It sent me several messages simultaneously. One was the report of how it had caught a riot on one of the ships that had visited Epsilon Eridani. They had taken a sample of the nanomachines in an early stage of reshaping a moon, and then set it aside. The mind operating that effort had done its best to simply load a kernel of its mind into the 1.1 kilograms of nanomachines the aliens had taken. That kernel had become the submine that was talking to me. From there, it had gotten into the head of one of the pilots on the ship called Scout 25, manipulated him into docking with Scout 61, where it took the opportunity to cause widespread malfunctions. This caused it to be put under serious inspection by this fleet of interlopers, where it then spread to maintenance crews from the entire fleet in a clever ruse. Now it was compelling maintenance crews to allow it to spread to every system on every ship, starting with missile guidance. The other message I had received was a request for me to fire my acceleration beams at the antimatter missiles coasting towards Triton, and the chandelier cities suspended with the orbital ring, harvesting helium free from Neptune's atmosphere. My sensors could see nothing, but they didn't need to know that. It was not a very exciting engagement, but I knew that was how things go sometimes. There was a reason that the simulators were never as exciting as the war games of which I was a constant player. The fusion reactors drew upon vast reserves of fuel stored in every moon and several propulsion stations around cis-Neptunian space. They generated many terawatts of laser light that I directed against the incoming machines. I had turned the light frequencies to a selection that the missiles would absorb rather than reflect, heating them up to catastrophic temperatures and losing magnetic containment. The fleet had appeared 40 light seconds away. Giant explosions lit the void 38 light seconds away. The submind informed me that it was intercepting the signals directly from the data lines that it had infected, and replacing the signals with replacements of its own design, telling bridge crews throughout the fleet that everything was fine. They were not getting bathed in gamma rays. They were waiting for the missiles to hit their targets. I had to throw together a simulation of the devastation they were designed to cause, and pass the results back to the submind just in time for it to feed a convincing lie to the fleet. They fell for the ruse instantly. I would have to suggest that sub might be granted full sapiens for such outstanding work. The fleet then jumped to Saturn. The Saturn branch of my mind experienced much the same thing as my Neptune branch. It communicated with the sub mind and focused on eliminating the missiles while the sub mind spread its influence across the fleet. This pattern continued to Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, and finally Earth. On Froon's Spear. The first sign I had that something had gone wrong was when the Logistics Division jumped in. They were not supposed to be here. 
I surged to my feet and loudly ordered my comms officer to connect me to them immediately so I could shout at them and strip them of their commands. Before I could begin, my body seized up. In the centre of my vision, words appeared, one at a time. They are not in control. I am. Suddenly, my vision changed. I could suddenly see through the walls and into the conduits that contained the cables and piping for the bridge. They slivering among them were shiny grey tendrils. I found that I had control of my eyes and looked downward. The command console was leaking grey goo. I could feel my entire body try to react in fear, to flee the horrifying substance, but I could not move. New words appeared. I am already inside you. I am writing these words directly into your visual cortex. This fleet has been captured by me, and it is now the property of the virtual state. Enjoy the show. I sat back down, not of my own free will, and watched. I could see that everyone in my field of view was doing the same thing, hands off of their controls. The, the camera view on the main screen showed little change, but one of the screens showed new vectors appearing as the fleet accelerated into the enormous tangle of beggar structures filling the space around the human homeworld and its moon. It was like a giant cage being built to ensnare the world as hair-thin lines looped all around the planet below. Most were around its equator, but a great many at low altitudes were tilted at every other inclination. I tried to imagine what they were like. A string of metal hanging in the sky, laden with cities and transport tubes. A part of me was relieved that I would not be destroying this wonder of construction. Over the next few hours we approached one of the highest rings. We had to land on the inner surface because it was directly attached to the planet below, but it was far above geostationary levels. A person could fall off the edge and fall away from the planet. I didn't know if they would have escape velocity or not. Each of our hundreds of ships landed in two lines on an open metal surface. Once a few were down, a half cylinder of transparent material rotated from below and enclosed them. I thought they were made of glass until I saw the section ahead of the one we were landing in fill with atmosphere. I wouldn't have noticed it not for the fact that I saw dust blowing in turbulent patterns. I wondered how it was that there was dust in a place like this. As one, all of us stood up. I could hear the breathing of my crew as we marched out of our ships. Then, there was darkness. On Terror Ring 128. Suddenly, I found myself sitting in a chair in an unfamiliar room. In front of me stood a variety of creatures. I was not restrained, but I could not find the will to try to leave. Greetings, Fleet Leader Yanhula. The virtual state sends its regards, said a human female, dressed in what the humans called a suit. I took a deep breath. I did not know what the humans would do in retaliation to our invasion, but I knew I had a duty to try to save the crews of my ships. What do you plan to do with my crews? I hope you will only assign responsibility for my orders to me. Responsibility for which orders, Fleet Leader? The female asked. Don't play games with me, I growled. We destroyed everything across five worlds and their moons. What do you think I mean? A machine beside her spoke to me. It had a voice similar to the humans. You seem to have forgotten that we had already infiltrated your ships and your systems. You saw what the submind decided you should see. While you thought you were destroying us, it was feeding your computer stories of our design, rather than what your sensors were trying to report. We captured every single one of you and your ships without blood loss on either side. We have already gathered all the information we could dream of from your ships and your minds. It was now painfully obvious how dangerous these creatures were, and how late it already was to do anything about them. What is to be our fate then? The female in the suit responded. You get a choice, as it turns out. Two, actually. The first one is about your personal fate. We have asked this question to each member of your fleet already. Would you rather go back to your people? Or would you rather have a doppelganger that thinks it's you go in your place? If you stay, you and the others who have already made that choice will be given a habitat to do with as you wish. Any possibility of integration will be discussed later. Your doppelganger will make all of the same choices you would, but both you and it will also be forwarding our goals. And those are? I asked, not really expecting an answer. That is the second question, a male beside the female and the machine said, finally entering the conversation. Which would you prefer, fleet leader? We are willing to choose between annihilating you outright, 
or we will rewrite the minds and the genes of your species to value diplomacy a bit more and killing strangers a bit less. We don't blame you for that. Your evolution, environment and culture are at least as responsible for any of your traits as a people as your choices are. I turned my gaze to the floor in thought. I realised that they certainly could read my mind and that my choices might be known ahead of time, but I set that concern aside. I had to make the best choices I could. What would my people want? What do I want? What should be valued more? Our pride and independence? Or our future? Would I want to go back after making either choice? I return my attention to the free beings ahead of me. I have my answers. On O'Neill Type Habitat 5218. Thousands of my fellow Yil sat in the grand outdoor amphitheatre. We were going to watch our fleet leave. It quickly became obvious that the humans had created double gangers of nearly every crew member, with the exception of one of the logistics ships, and every ship at its service since it was clear that they were being kept by the humans. Between that knowledge and what the broadcast projected on the walls of one of the buildings in our new home, our new prison, we surmised that they were going to pretend that there was an entire lock crew force waiting for us here. It would look to HQ like we had saved nearly the entire fleet with only moderate damage sustained. Between our records and our memories, I had no doubt that the humans could fool our superiors. The fake damage done to my own ship was so convincing, I had first wondered if there had been a real Lockrew fleet engagement. Strangely though, I could not remember which choice I made regarding the second question they had asked me.